Let me first get the microphone adjusted to you. Yeah, it's all right. Thank you. Okay. I, I want to start by saying I remember that event in Toronto, and I started my talk by saying that when I first heard theories of sphere sovereignty, I thought they must be physical an explanation of the way frisbees work. <laughs> and no one laughed. <laughs> that was, I, I took it that that was what reformed, would, the reformed folks would uh, never cotton to what I had to say, so that I'm here. <laughs> it's quite, I regard as a miracle. <laughs> Well, we, we, we thank you and, and the Lord that this miracle happened. Um, let me first briefly introduce myself. I'm Hans Schaefer. I uh, was a minister for eight years and I am now back at the Theological University in Compton teaching practical theology, married with my wife Rinske, and we have a wonderful eight year old daughter, Linden. Um, as already mentioned, the program is quite simple. We will uh, most foremost listen to the study of Hamas and talk about his theology today. Um, but of course we are glad that you are here as well. So many people showed up and signed up for this uh, conference. Many of you, I guess, will be theologians, many of you will be uh, ministers perhaps. Many of you will know something about the work and theology of Stanley Hamas at least to some degree, some may even be called experts in his theology. And experts or not, what we want to do is listen. And we will we'll take our time to think through topics and insights, perspectives, and we sincerely hope that you will be inspired today and strengthened to become or stay vulnerable Christians, called to serve your fellow human beings and the Creator in whatever ministry you are called to. We sincerely hope that this day is not just about curiosity, uh, about knowledge, but that we taste something of the transformative power of sound and creative theology as well. And first of all, I would like to uh, ask some questions in order of uh, <coughs> was starting, starting this day. Dear Stanley, today you will, will be about understanding what you want to tell us. One way of doing so would have been to ask you to deliver a thorough theological lecture on one specific topic, or to give a thorough overview of theology and ethics in general. But we rather thought it appropriate to do it by way of a conversation. Many of uh, your books and books on your opinions bear that word conversation in the title. So we would just like to ask some questions and we hope that by getting along with this particular conversation we in Holland get the chance to learn from you once more. And the first question I would like to ask is, we know that you are primarily here in the Netherlands on the occasion of Hans Reiner's retirement already mentioned. It was yesterday which was I guess a, quite a long and intense day. Um, could you tell us something about on why and at which point the lives and theology of you both coincided? Um, first of all, let me say, um, I understand um, what a gift you've given to do this in English. And I try to remember that to only speak English is the um, result of being a citizen of an imperialist nation. So I hope I will um, be appropriately aware of the gift you've given for me uh, uh, to be here um, as an English speaker uh, and uh, trying, I hope I won't impose my presumptions in the language 
on you in a way that's coercive. Um, Hans, um, on our way up, uh, reminded uh, me of the first time I came to the Netherlands was at Hans's uh, invitation to be part of a conference, and I can't remember Hans what the subject of the conference was, um, but I can tell you what I did was not well received. Um, uh, and then um, uh, Hans and I, I think, recognized that we have kindred spirits, and um, we stayed in contact through uh, I'm a letter writer, and we wrote back and forth. And then Hans uh, came to America for a time when he was at Notre Dame, and we had closer contact. And then I think both of our being pulled into uh, the world of, uh, of the mentally disabled uh, meant that we shared increasingly um, uh, concerns that made it possible for us to learn from one another. And um, it is, um, friendship is such an important uh, reality for me uh, uh, because it's through friends like Hans that you realize that the world you inhabit is not the world. So it is. What do you mean by that? The world you inhabit is not the world? Uh, it means that um, to teach theology at Duke Divinity School um, um, <coughs> is uh, to be in a very parochial context that uh, requires um, you learning from people uh, elsewhere that don't have the challenge of being rich. So um, uh, that is um, uh, the kinds of, uh, of friendships that pull you into a different world. For example, um, I mean, one of the things you're out of the, your comfort zone. And, and well, I don't like phrases like comfort zone. <laughs> but uh, I mean, one of the one of the I mean, I find this kind of context very intimidating because it's intimidating to be taken seriously by people, um, and uh, and so uh, I mean, for example, I received a letter years ago from a man named Emmanuel Katangali, a Ugandan who's doing, a Ugandan priest who's doing his PhD in theology at Leuven and is writing a dissertation on me. You know, I think, for God's sakes, what can I tell a Ugandan about what it means to be a Christian in Uganda? But Emmanuel helps me know better how to read myself than I would be able to do without a manual. Uh, and um, that's the kind of friendships that I feel my life has been graced by through which you have pulled in to other people's worlds. Okay. Uh, so that is what, what bound you and Hans together? I hope so. I, yeah. I certainly think so. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. And one of the topics, of course, on the Hans and, and your theolog theological thinking is about, uh, well, people with so-called disabilities. And um, I would press on this a little bit further. Is it uh, about vulnerability that we, we, we can learn or uh, learning to be vulnerable? Uh, I mentioned more than once uh, this, this day this wonderful booklet of yours and Jean Vanier, which has been translated just and presented yesterday, Zalig de Zachmoedige, het profetisch getuigenis van zwakheid. You can buy it in the, the, book, uh, the book table uh, at the back of this, this building. Um, it's, it states there to be friends with them, with people with uh, disabilities, implies being friends with 
time? Is it something like that that is, we learn from them, vulnerability, uh, patience? Uh, how did you become so patient? Um, well, first of all, I think to be pulled into the world of the mentally disabled is partly the way Hans and I try to have lives that are more decent than our, than is possible given the fact that we're professors at research universities in which we have privileges that um, make us people who you really don't want to know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and to be pulled into that world um, means that you are confronted in a way that makes you I'm, it, vulnerable, to try to be vulnerable is about as stupid as to try to be humble. Um, uh, the very fact that you try already indicates that you're not. Uh, so um, vulnerability is not something you can will. It's something that happens to you because of who God has sent into your life. It's something that befalls you. Yes. And so, um, vulnerability um, is a characteristic that happens to you through the friendships that have been made possible through largely accident. And, um, and it is to be, um, uh, do I agree with that sentence you read about becoming a friend of time? I sure as hell do, I wrote it. And uh, so, um, it's, it's a, to become a friend of time implies also that you become, that to be, to be a friend of time entails also always an openness to death because time and death are intrinsically related. And there are all kinds of deaths that we uh, confront. And one of them is uh, what it means to come to recognition um, of the otherness of other people's lives that are a deep challenge to your own. And so that's to become a to become a friend of time and vulnerability to uh, to death is uh, intrinsically related, I think. And uh, to live with the perspective of death, your 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 being a uh, a person that that can die. And well, for a Christian, I'm not just can, but will. <laughs> Unless the Lord comes back. Yeah, right. I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm 75. I say I'm beginning to realize that death is not a theoretical possibility. <laughs> <laughs> but that also entails for Christians the perspective of eschatology, I guess. It certainly does. I, uh, I recently, um, you know, I. I, I put together essays that make them look like books. And um, one of them um, uh, recently is called uh, Approaching the End, and it's on eschatology, or I think most of the essays deal with eschatology and how death uh, functions uh, for us as, um, I mean, if people, the question is, is if we didn't die, how would we know our lives and other lives are valuable? Because if you didn't die, uh, life would not have, uh, it would not be precious. Um, um, but just to the extent that death helps us <coughs> recognize the preciousness of existence, it also becomes the enemy because we don't want to lose the friends that we've made. 
through having an economy that makes friendship crucial. So um, um, I think, that, I mean, it's interesting how little Christians hear from the pulpit about how to die and uh, how to learn to die. The art school you the... Yeah, I, um, um, I was a, there was a wonderful um, a friend um, at Duke Divinity School I had named Stuart Henry. Stuart was uh, 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 an American church historian uh, who had done his PhD at Duke and then had been the pastor in, at, in Mississippi and then came back to teach. And uh, I, I say <coughs> Stuart was a Presbyterian, so the world was very dark for Stuart. <laughs> and he was condemned to live among the Methodists for who there was no darkness at all. <laughs> and, um, but he was, very, he was a very close friend. He was a classic Southern gentleman who had fallen in love early in his life, whose love married another gentleman, which meant that, of course, he could never fall in love again. So he was a bachelor, uh, Southern, classical Southern badness. I'm um, a classical Southern, um, uh, Gentleman who um, uh, led a led a life of um, of scholarship and friendship, and he was a close friend. People didn't understand how someone that was a southern gentleman and I could be friends, but we were. And uh, see, I'm a Texan. I'm not a southerner. And uh, and but Stuart, one of his gifts to me was to let me be a friend of his during the last two years of his life as he moved to death. And we don't get to, I mean, dying, you need to learn just like learning to live. And so it was a great gift for him to let me see his vulnerability <laughs> as he uh, approached death what it means that you can no longer control your kidneys, so, uh, those kinds of things. So um, uh, it is very important that as Christians we learn how to um, intend death in that way. I'm a, uh, I'm a communicant. As you know, I'm an ecclesial whore. Um, 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 I, um, uh, I've never, I'm, I'm an enthusiastic churchgoer, but I have um, been, I mean, a high church Mennonite. What in the hell do you do with that? <laughs> you, end up, uh, you end up being an Episcopalian in Chapel Hill, which um, <coughs> I'm a communicant at the Church of the Holy Family. And one of the things about the Church of the Holy Family is we, we, baptized through immersion and our baptismal is in the form of a cross that um, is about 10 feet long and with uh, the vertical bar being about six feet and one of them we had a member about uh, five or six years ago um, uh, she was a wonderful person who was in her 50s and she and her husband were vital members of the church and she uh, she unexpectedly died at about 50 and it was um, it was extraordinary event for the church and um, um, her husband asked that the casket be brought with her body in it to the church and laid on the baptismal and we vigiled it through the night and that uh, event then became a precedent for which we do it often connecting our baptisms with our deaths in a way that has
has been quite extraordinary for the church, just to the extent that we therefore are invited to uh, see the relationship when we baptize an infant and where they will end up. So that also baptism is not only about living and saying grace to the Creator, it's also about dying. In, in uh, absolutely. Way. I mean, if if parents attended to what we're saying we're going to do to this <clears throat> child and what this child is under, going to undergo through baptism, I suspect there would be fewer baptisms. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to, to another uh, question. Thank you very much for sharing this, uh, the way in which we, we live and have to live in a, in a vulnerable, vulnerable way, which is not as easy as we might think. Um, your uh, autobiography is called Hannah's Child, which I think is an impressive account of both personal, theological and relational events that have befallen you. And I would like to, to present the, the title a little bit more. The biblical Hannah received her son and dedicated Samuel to a very specific calling, and it meant a kind of special election, representing both a blessing and a vocation containing a heavy burden. Could you explain to us why you chose that title and before you, or why I'm answering, I'll give you some water. I guess oh, fine. Okay. Okay. Um, um, well, I chose the title because I thought it a central event to make my life intelligible. My mother and father married late. My father was um, the fifth um, son of six sons of my, um, my family were all bricklayers. I was raised a bricklayer. <coughs> And um, my, father, my grandmother, who was a coffee from northern Alabama, a coffee, C-O-F-F-E-E. -E. Um, it was, a, it was a, an aristocratic family uh, who had gone to sea um, uh, in Florence, Alabama. My grandfather um, was from Minnesota. He went down to help the family make brick. Uh, and he ran off with my grandmother and since the Coffee family had pretensions, my grandfather then migrated to Texas. Uh, where, um, and um, my grandmother had decided that my father should be the son that remained unmarried to take care of her as she aged. My mother came from White Trash, Mississippi. Um, and uh, um, she ended up in Texas and decided to marry my father, which meant conflict with my grandmother. But they, they did marry, and, but they married late, and my mother had trouble having children. So my mother had been raised Baptist in Mississippi, uh, uh, and she had heard the story of Hannah. And so she prayed to God that if God would give her a son, she would give that son to God which was perfectly appropriate for her to do, but did she have to tell me when I was six? So I had to live with that story. And um, I, I say, um, I mean, when people ask me how I became a theologian, I, I always explain that I became a theologian because I couldn't get saved. Um, um, we, we were, a Methodist church, evangelical Methodist church. You joined the church on Sunday morning, but you had to be saved on Sunday night. And Sunday night was at least a two-hour service because you couldn't be saved unless the sermon had lasted at least 45 to 50 minutes. And um, I, so I wanted to be saved, but it, I didn't think you should fake it. So I, I, I kept sitting there Sunday night after Sunday night thinking that uh, God should save me. But uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen. So one Sunday night, I was about 15, I'd started to date, so I was sinning. So I knew that uh, I needed Satan. And I thought, if God isn't going to save me, I can at least dedicate my life to the Lord 
and people, some of the other youth have been doing this, um, uh, and that would put God under exigency. <laughs> uh, and of course, that story about Hannah was still eating on me. So um, one night we were singing "I Surrender All" for the 25th time, and uh, I thought, "Hell, this is going to go on all night if uh, someone doesn't do something." So I did. I went up and I dedicated my life to the Lord. And, uh, 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 and then the associate minister of the church, who had actually gone to seminary and had read books told me I should read books. So I read a lot of bad books, but I, I found a book by uh, David Napier called From Faith to Faith, and it turned out he was um, an Old Testament scholar at Yale. And of course, we weren't smart enough to be fundamentalists, but we thought the Bible was true, and I discovered it wasn't. And uh, I thought, well, that's something. And then, and then I read a book by Nels F.S. Foray called The Son of the Umbrella. He was a Swedish Londensian, and uh, he, he, using Plato's cave, he suggested that religion probably hid God as much as revealed God. And I thought, well, that's probably true, so I gave it up. But I didn't tell my parents I'd given it up. And none of my family had ever gone to college, but since I was going into the ministry, I was told I had to go to college. So I went, to, uh, so I did go to college, and, um, um, I was the philosophy major at Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. And uh, through reading philosophy, I had a wonderful teacher. We read Copleston for um, uh, th uh, uh, six semesters with the primaries. And I would again, you read? Uh, Frederick Copleston's History okay. of Philosophy. Okay. And, um, and uh, I began to understand that I wasn't smart enough to be an atheist at that time. So uh, I thought I would go to divinity school to discover if the thing, stuff was true. And um, I thought if I was going to be a Christian, I would be a liberal Christian. Tillich, et cetera, uh, was very influential on me in college. And I thought I'd begun to think that one of the decisive challenges to being, uh, to the truthfulness of Christianity was the Holocaust and our complicity with the Nazis and giving up the Jews. And um, I thought that it would be the liberals that stood against that. And suddenly, I discovered Bart and Bonhoeffer. So I started reading the dogmatics, and I've never looked back. That's how Hannah's child became a Christian. And uh, insofar as I have, and um, so, it was through uh, uh, Barnes Dogmatics that um, I began to see my life as determined by God. So you really adopted that, that phrase for yourself in a way. I did. You really applied to the Yeah. Then. So I became I was, I became the Hannah's child. Yeah, you became Hannah's child. <coughs> uh, one of the, the most well-known aspects of your work, at least what I guess here in the Netherlands, is uh, your influence on the uh, topic and, and practice of non-violence, or better to say, the, the practice of peace, perhaps. I, I much prefer that. Yeah, okay, the practice of, of, of peace. I mean, you think about, I, I mean, I hate the language of pacifism, because it's just so passive. <laughs> and, um, and I don't like non-violence because it's not violence. Um, the crucial um, question is the practice of peace and how do you see it? Um, how do you know what it is? Because only if you have only if you have peace will you be able to recognize violence. And where can we find that practice of peace? Well, I should like to think that first and foremost in the worship of God where we find our, um, our hatred of God transformed through the recognition of God's glory that overwhelms my um, 
desire to be my own creature. And then how that overwhelming um, provides the occasion for having our lives constituted by life that comes from others such as exemplified, I mean, in this book by Jean Manier and what Marsh is able to do. So, I think ontologically, peace is a more determinative reality than violence. Only violence is just so damned interesting. We find it hard to let peace overwhelm us. So I try to establish reminders that our lives really are constituted by God's peace that makes it possible for us to live. I would reflect on that a little bit further because my, my own practice as a, a preacher was that it is harder to preach about evil sins about things that go wrong, uh, then about the glory of God, uh, what, what the, the new kingdom entails. Somehow it's easier to deal with, with the, the, the brokenness of, of reality than with the perspective of God himself. Um, I get, you only know brokenness in the light of the reality of God's Grace. That's one of, one of the um, great, uh, I think, problematic aspects of Protestantism is to make sin too interesting. Um, uh, I think Barth's views about you only know sin from your way out of it is profoundly right. Um, I mean, one, one of the great um, mistakes of Protestantism is, um, um, is to um, think that sin can be named prior to Christology. And, um, and, and I, I have the other view also that um, redemption enacted in Christ is deeper than simply the overwhelming of sin. That it's genuinely a new creation that overwhelms sin, but is not limited to that overwhelming. It is glory. And glory is a uh, reality that um, that creates. I mean, you think of Isaiah's calling. Um, Isaiah six. Uh, Isaiah six, where where he, he is overwhelmed by God's glory in a way that um, uh, he his lips are renewed. And he's given a message that is anything but happy, <laughs> but um, uh, proclaim, let them not hear. So I, I hope that, I, that sin, of course, is a reality, but as such, it is not one that we let determine the glory of God that we have been given in Christ. And the, and the glory of God we experience first and foremost in, in worshiping God in the liturgy. Right. Um, from that praxis of peace with the liturgy, it is always a great step to the reality of humankind, especially if we 
take our European context nowadays with this constant stream of refugees fleeing from Syria. Um, we probably all have that picture in mind in uh, last autumn, the little child drowned at the shores of Turkey. Um, to live in peace uh, is hard for us when we think of, well, we, we have to do something on that. What do we have to do? We, we, we cannot just sit down there and be perplexed, or should we have to? Well, I think at the heart of the challenge of the refugees for Christians is um, the virtue of hospitality as constitutive of our lives. Because we are people, the very fact that we exist is in recognition of God's hospitality to us. We, don't, we didn't have to exist. I, I always say the question is not, does God exist, but do we? And what does, so existence is an analogical term that um, uh, only God exists without loss. We, uh, our existence is always um, less fulsome than I mean, that's what it means to be finite. And therefore, um, what um, our very character should be as a community is one of hospitality. And therefore, and it's not just hospitality for other Christians, but that's not a bad place to start. It is hospitality to lives that ask us to welcome them. And I think, therefore, I mean, this is one of the interesting places that you begin to see how the Christian commitment to hospitality to the refugee and the stranger calls into question the presumption of the modern state that it's constituted by boundaries. Uh, and, uh, I mean, people forget that's a relatively new um, development, the notion of a line on a map determining relations and how boundaries work. So there are different <coughs> theoretical uh, issues involved in how our hospitality to the immigrant uh, raises questions about the status of the modern nation state in a way that I suspect most people prefer <coughs> not to have to confront. So it's, and also the fact that the Christian community is a, a Catholic community in a way, right? No, I, uh, I, uh, uh, the role of the bishop, and I think that no church exists without some people, whether they're called bishop or not, serving in <coughs> the function. Even the most low church ones. Even, even the most low church ones, especially the most low church ones, because they always get stuck with some, usually son of a bitch. <laughs> control over them because they don't understand the church has no basis for calling it bishop. Um, but um, uh, the role of the bishop, the role of the bishop is to ensure that when I come to Amsterdam, I have some, some confidence that the God I worship at a church in Amsterdam is the same God I worship at Holy Family in Chapel Hill. And so how, how that connections work um, is uh, crucial for the church Catholic recognizing that we are a more determinative political reality than the nation state. We could go on this political kind of, uh, the, the, the political character of worship and church a, lo a long time. I would start a, a, another topic. Um, which is about uh, the, the position that you are forced into sometimes or 
is claimed for you, especially, I guess, here in the, in the Netherlands, um, people tend to think that you are a kind of champion of the orthodox camp, and you're at least not liberal, you're opposed to liberalism. How do you think with that, to be, to be welcomed as a champion of orthodoxy? Well, I take it that orthodoxy is always, in uh, Gailey's term, an essentially contested concept. And so, um, uh, what I value um, is how orthodoxy names a tradition of argument across time about matters that matter for the church to be the church. Like the, the, the Catholicity as, as the bishop warns. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's like, um, uh, as someone has been influenced by uh, John Yoder, Yoder in Preface to Theology, uh, which was his course in the history of doctrine at um, the Associated Mennonite Bible Seminary. I mean, he would teach the whole tradition. I mean, he, unlike, unlike the reform, he did not believe that Christianity began in the 17th century. And um, uh, uh, so um, uh, uh, he taught the whole tradition. And when he was going over Nicaea, and there's a big debate among the Mennonites about whether Nicaea is normative, because obviously Caesar was sitting in the main seat. Um, uh, and Yoder gave the argument that Nicaea was um, uh, important for Mennonites in terms of the centrality of, of the Trinity as the expression of Christian faith. And one um, student asked him, well, um, is at Nicaea the last word? And John said, we don't know yet. <laughs> I, I, I mean, orthodoxy is the way we maintain the faith to the extent that we don't know yet. And so I, uh, I think that um, obviously part of what makes me um, uh, very committed to the tradition is why I think how that kinds of arguments are absolutely crucial for the centrality of Christ for our faith. So it's the Christological moves that yeah. are so important for me. And the, the, the tradition in that way is a kind of holding on to that mm -hmm. means it provides you the opportunity to stay in touch with the, the, the Church Catholic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Across time. Across time as well. Uh, is that a, an explanation of why some people, or you yourself perhaps, would, would uh, say about you that you, you are kind of radical? Or <coughs> is it a, I mean, um, in a way you say sometimes, I'm, I'm just ordinary, I'm, I'm sticking to what, what, was, what was taught centuries before. Is that so strange and new? And so, somehow it is new for us, for people here. What is, what's going on there? I would never trust anyone that says they're radical. Um, um, on top of that, you know, I mean, that's, just, that's, just, that's just pretension on the stick. Um, uh, uh, I would think, um, I, I mean, I suppose what I think in terms of the centrality of discipleship as integral to what it means to worship Jesus as the Son of God, that that's going to make you weird in ways you hadn't anticipated. And if you want to call that radical, that's okay. But I don't think you try to be radical, to be radical. I don't think you try to be different, to be different. It just turns out you discover that that may happen to you because you worship Jesus Christ as the second person of the Trinity. And that also touches upon 
the, the contrast community. I mean, you, we do not look, we shouldn't look for being a contrast community. It turns out to be one. It just turns out that way. Yeah. And that, um, I was saying on the way up, um, of course, I was raised in a little town called Pleasant Grove, Texas. And um, there, Southern, Southern Baptist ruled the world. And um, you know that they ruled the world because they thought dancing was the worst sin you could possibly. Um, uh, Which is quite worse as well. Yeah, yeah very <laughs> um, the re um, uh, I mean, it was often said the reason that Southern Baptists thought you shouldn't make love is someone might think you were dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and of course they went. They wouldn't. They wouldn't let. They wouldn't let you um, have a dance in, uh, as part of the senior prom of, of the high school. Uh, and I mean, that was a that was a desperate attempt of a church to show the difference that being a Christian made when they lived in a world in which they couldn't show the difference of being a Christian made. And because that was. That was, they were so accommodated to the way of life. I mean, Southern Baptist pastors um, were in Texas um, uh, dressed just like uh, the person that owned the local funeral parlor and sold used cars, you know, bolo tie and that kind of thing. And that's the reason why you couldn't tell the difference between Southern Baptist pastors and Texas politicians. The, um, um, because they were exactly the same kind of ambitious people that um, uh, were uh, not exactly attractive folk. But, so, it, you just don't become different by trying to discover um, what you shouldn't do. Uh, I take it that the difference will occur fundamentally because of the passions that have seized your life from being made part of the Church of Jesus Christ in a way that determines your life from beginning to end. Being determined as a, as a Christian from birth to, to death and even later on then. Yeah, I mean, if you think, I say in a hundred years, what the remnant of Christianity that's left in the West, if they are identified as people who don't kill their children and kill the elderly, we will have done all right. We will have done all right. Don't kill your children. Don't abort. Don't kill the elderly. Because both those things are going to happen in the name of compassion. Because people think that the good is to spare people from suffering. And just to the extent that that is presumed the manifestation of compassion, you will see how compassion becomes a killer in the world in which we live. Uh, before we, we, we continue, we should be friends with time as well, as we uh, as it says. Um, it is that the program originally uh, uh, said that we should now turn to, to the to five other speakers of this morning, but I guess we should take just a, a little bit more for this conversation. Uh, if you are right with that. Uh, just uh, 10 minutes more, so it's so half past. No problem. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not exactly hesitant <laughs> about speech. No. Which is a good thing, because I want to listen to you as well. Um, within the academic uh, theological debate, it's all about positions as well. and. Um, one could say, perhaps, that you do not have such a position in a way. You just you are not the one to be fixed down to one 
or another uh, point of view, orthodoxy may be just as foundationalist as liberalism. You may be said to be much more radical on this. The practice, the story you believe in, is what it's all about. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about uh, being a disciple? You, you wrote, uh, together with many others, that Companion to Christian Ethics, uh, stating that the Christian life, Christian ethics, is about being part of the, the liturgy. How can we really live our day? I mean, liturgy in, in the church, okay, that, that's okay, that's fine, we can do our things. How does it really affect lives of people in, on Monday and, and Tuesday? How can the liturgy re really... It, it, it's not a kind of instrument we use in order to, to do something. It's something that shapes character, something that... Well, I don't want to... I, I want to be very careful not to make the liturgy instrumental to some other end than what the liturgy should do in terms of forming us for the worship of God. Mm -hmm. But I take it that through the liturgy we are made part of a narrative that shapes who we are in a way that helps us discover that we are not our own creator. And that, I cannot imagine, doesn't make all the difference in the world for the kind of people that, that are able, in a world of such deep injustice, to continue to have children. I, I think people um, often take for granted the presumption that the common realities of life, such as having children, are not absolutely suffused with moral commitments that you can lose if you fail to acknowledge them. I, I, what I want to know, for example, I mean, modern atheism is so uninteresting because we haven't been very interesting as Christians to make it, to make denying what we believe um, that substantive. Uh, uh, I mean, McIntyre's uh, comment that modern Christianity has given the atheist less and less in which to disbelieve. And uh, I think that that's been a deep problem and makes atheists extraordinarily dumb. But, uh, but the crucial issue like, if you, if you no longer, if your life is no longer shaped by being called into the people of God to have the confidence in a world of such deep uh, uh, evil to bring children into the world, then how could you possibly not see the significance of what it is when you worship God? Because if life is eat, drink, screw, and die, why do you want to impose that on new life? Mm -hmm. I often observe that um, the monks of modernity are the yuppies who would rather have a boat than a child. And that's partly because why impose the meaninglessness of your life on a future generation? Now, how for Christians to recover those kinds of fundamental <coughs> practices that are shaped by our faith that I think is just waiting there to be recovered. To get children is a way to state or, or, or say that we, we want to live differently in this world because we want something like that. Have, yeah. I mean we I mean they I, I mean I take it 
one of the great um, one of the great moral um, institutions of recent time, I mean over the last few centuries, was <coughs> the Jewish refusal to let Christian persecution stop them from having children. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that having a child is the same commitment that is part of what it means to be a Jew. Mm -hmm. But I think that the power of that is um, undeniable for the constitution of the people of God to be a sign for the world of what hope looks like. Yeah. Except it's about hope, it's about right. time again. I mean, it is, I mean, in a world of impatience, we Christians have all the time in the world to have children who are going to slow you down. They really do. <laughs> One last question to, as a, as a follow-up on this, um, because liturgy it also entails a kind of community. You don't worship God only on your own. It's kind of being part of the community, it shapes the community, it forms the community, it's received through community. Uh, in our times, especially perhaps here in, in, in the Netherlands at least, uh, within the, the sort of post-modern times, commitments and community are under stress, under fire. Um, we, People may say, uh, if a community doesn't bring what I want it to bring, then uh, I will well choose another that fits my desires better. Uh, how can we perceive the stress of community in a time where community is so much under fire and commitment is, is not easily worn? Well, I, I'm often characterized as a communitarian in terms of the political theory as an alternative liberalism. And I don't want to be a communitarian. Um, communitarianism in modernity, given the formation of liberal social orders, will always mean the, the um, prioritization of the modern nation state. I mean, if you, want, if you want to know what communitarian looks like, it looks like the celebration of the American military in, um, in America right now as a response to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, that's, that's community, mm -hmm. and it scares the hell out of me. Like Lady Gaga singing. Right, right. Um, and so, um, it's not community, quad community, that's important. It's the kind of relationships that are embodied by a church uh, through the worship of God in a way that makes our lives need the lives of the person that kneels beside me to receive the body and blood of Christ. So um, I think I think that one of the aspects of modernity, I, my little way of putting it is, uh, and is modernity names the time of the production of people who believe they should have no story except the story they chose when they had no story. In America, that's called freedom. Um, I, of course, I'm very fortunate. I wasn't storied by that story because I'm a Texan. And, um, uh, I knew I was given a story before I chose one. Uh, um, uh, the problem with the story that you should have no story except the story you chose when you had no story is uh, who told you that story? <laughs> and, um, uh, and that's the reason why, because you cannot acknowledge that that's your story, um, that's the reason why freedom becomes fate and why most American Christians are really stoics in disguise. The, um, um, and if you don't believe that your story, I oftentimes, I mean, it's all of our stories, you can't avoid it. Um, uh, if you don't believe that's your story, I say, should you be held responsible for decisions you made when you did not know what you were doing? 
most people do not believe they should be held responsible for a decision they made when they did not know what they were doing. And of course, the only problem with that is it makes marriage unintelligible. Because how would you ever know what you were doing when you promised lifelong monogamous fidelity? Uh, I mean, and if it makes marriage unintelligible, try having children. You never get the ones you want. Now, it, it, it exactly, therefore, um, uh, the Christian presumption is, is of course, you should. You have been storied by God because you're a creature, and creature is an unbelievable story. Um, uh, that unbelievable in the sense it's so powerful. So exactly, Christians have a story, our story, in a way that is a great challenge to modernity. And I bring all this up because I think the story that you should have no story except the story you chose when you had no story is a formula for loneliness. And if there's anything that I think people are dying of today is loneliness. And exactly lonely, the, the attempt to provide an alternative to loneliness is called nationalism. And what we offer as Christians is you have been made a friend through being pulled into a community that will help you live the truth of the story that you have been given. Namely, you did not have to exist, but God desired your existence because God is a God of love who would call into the world people as strange as you and me. Stanley, I think that we could go on for some more hours talking about things, and we, I'd love to, but there is still many others who want to say something as well. But thank you very much so far. Uh, we will hear from you in, in due time, responding to the, uh, the other ones. Uh, I suppose that you'd rather sit just there than the whole day here? Um, I'll sit where you tell me to okay. sit. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite immediate. <laughs> I, I, I would suggest you take place there and we will continue with the, uh, the other speakers. Thank you for your questions. Okay, thank you.